welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Show with Ryan Greenberg and Nick Calpas. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Everyday Millionaire Show. We're here with Andy Lee. That's right, Andy Lee. You like Andrew or Andy? Andy. Andy. I actually had a friend in college named Andy Lee as well. Um, interesting. We grow on trees. <laughs> So, Andy, where are you coming from today? Unfortunately, New York City. Oh, goodness. I'm from Long Island originally, but I, I escaped. And I've been uh, down here in Maryland ever since. And it was a good good escape. Amazing. Uh, born and raised. Where, in the, uh, where are you? On the Chesapeake Bay or um, yeah, I'm, Maryland? Uh, just outside of Annapolis, in the suburbs yeah. of Annapolis. Yep. Yeah, it's a beautiful um, place. Yeah. Are you born and raised in New York City or... Uh, Champaign, Illinois. Oh, so that's a change up. Middle of fucking up. nowhere. That's a change up from, uh, yeah, from Illinois. Goodness, okay. Um, Little country bumpkin. <laughs> Are you living in New York now? Unfortunately, yes. Why do you say it like that? Is it just too too uh, hectic in, in New York? New York is full of grinders, and that probably brings out the worst of my personality. Um and so trying to find the notion of balance, I've really struggled here. Gotcha. So someday I'll make it out of the rat race, but we'll eventually get there. Nice, nice. So uh, one of the reasons we kind of booked this, to, I have no idea what a TRA is. We're both real estate investors. Um, we invest heavily in single family and small multifamily real estate Um and I saw this and I was like a TRA. It's not usually, you know, you hear about something, you, you kind of know it, but you don't really know it in this sense. I, I have no idea what this is. So I'd love you to uh, kind of run us through what first is a TRA and then we'll get into your business and such. Sure. So simplistically think about, let's start with on the asset side of the equation. Whenever you buy a piece of real estate, you get the benefit of a step up transaction that basically changes your basis to your purchase price relative to a seller who might have heavily depreciated his real estate previously. So that's on one side of the equation. You have a large step up that has gotten allocated to among other things, land, the structure, fixtures, improvements. And each of them have their own depreciable life. Might that be one year, five years, seven years, 15, 27 and a half, 39 years and non amortizable in have you ever heard of the up REIT um transaction by you know what a REIT is you know but uh, so effectively what um a number of large scale investors have done in the real estate space is to execute a REIT transaction where they have contributed their properties in kind into a public REIT and gotten units back in that transaction, the REIT got a full step up. And so that was valuable to them. Um, so the corporate world where I come from has adopted technology, that technology, that technology is known as the up REIT transaction and transformed it into the up C transaction, up C corp. So that's on one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, the, the seller who sold it to you obviously incurred significant tax liabilities whenever they sold. Effectively, what happens is that whenever the amortization or depreciation is realized, the buyer is then giving them a kickback, saying, in return for giving us a huge step on basis, we're going to share that benefit back to you, helping you reduce your cash tax savings. So we've done this across the likes of a Remax a Shake Shack, a Duff and Phelps. So large corporate businesses that are investment grade in the public markets. So this is more for like a big corporation rather than for single family owners or small multifamily owners? Confirm. That's right. So that that's an interesting thing. And I was reading about it and it just came, this whole thing just came out about 30 years ago. Is that right? Just about, yes, that's right. 30 years ago, almost feels like yesterday, I guess, to some. So I guess what, what my question is, what 
made this thing come out? Was it a change in legislature that made this like a, a viable investment strategy? Um, Cause you know, it's not something that seems very popular that from amongst, you know, us. So what, where did it come from and kind of what was the history behind it coming out? Absolutely. It entirely came out of the real estate world. As you guys well know, real estate guys have two advantages to them. First and foremost is they oftentimes never pay taxes. They defer, die, and then get the, the basis step up. And then two, they get the benefit of significant amounts of leverage. And so this technology from the REIT world got transformed to the C Corp world. In the US, for tax purposes, you cannot be a pass through entity whenever you go public. So you can be a REIT, you can be an MLP, a BDC, or a C Corp. You cannot be an LLC or an, a partnership. And so businesses, Many businesses here in the U.S. are LLCs. So asset management businesses like my own are LLCs. And when they've gone public, think the likes of a Blackstone, an Apollo, a Carlyle. They went public and they went from being a partnership to becoming a C-Corp. And in that transaction, they adopted technology from the REIT world to create the up, re, up C and thereafter create a tax receivable agreement. Okay. How did you how did you get into this? As backwards. Let's start with that. Just about everything in life. Um, I went to college a little early. I went to college when I was 15. And when I graduated, I was 17. And at that point of time, I was just too young to sign a lease in New York City. So my dad was like, you're going to go get a PhD. My parents are professors. And I was like, NFW, am I going to do a PhD? I'm going to spend five years of purgatory in my best years of my life. No way. Unfortunately, because I couldn't sign a lease, he um, I had to meet them in the middle. I did a master's and I did a master's in taxation. Um, post that, I started my career at Citigroup and m and um, And there I learned about a TRA as a result of a transaction between Rio Tinto and Cloud Peak, two mining majors. And I thought that was fascinating. Went down to a private equity firm down in Dallas called Lone Star Funds. And... The entire thing there was, they said, you would only get promoted if you were able to create something. And so I was like, what in the world does one create? I think what got a lot of laughs in the organization is that if you, I thought that drones were inevitable in our lifetimes. Then you would go buy all the air rights along the Hudson. And anytime Bezos flies a drone across, you would charge him a toll. Unfortunately, public easements like Liberty State Park, George Washington Bridge made it incredibly challenging for our investment thesis. And so that never got off the ground. What got off the ground is we created and monetized two tax receivable agreements. And ultimately, the firm said, how much can you deploy annually? I said, 150 million bucks. They said, that's tiny. It's not even worth, that's a rounding error for the firm. And so he said, look, why don't you go do this? We'll give you some money to go do. And if it doesn't work, I'll come back in two years. It's been six years. We've raised six funds, about half a billion dollars across the cap of capital. And this is all we did. Nice. So I, I think we skipped over this too quickly, but how did you end up in college at 15 years old? Little, very much monkey see, monkey do. So I went to college one block for, or two blocks from my parents' office to the high school that I went to was basically every professor's kids. Um, there were about 60 of us who went to college at 15. My sister included, who was two and a half years older than me, was part of the same program. And so it's one of those things where you don't really know or understand um, that it's odd that you're going to college early because everyone else in your class is doing it. And so that was a class that we pursued. And with that, I. I mean, I imagine you seem like a very smart guy, but all these people that went to college and did you have issues like socially at that time? Because being a 15 year old and, and most people in college are, you know, 18, 21. Did you ever ask anyone how old you were when you were freshman year of college? No, but I feel like I would have known if somebody was significantly younger than me in my freshman year because I felt like a little guy 
you know, with all these like adults or I went to a big university. I don't know where, where you went, but like, you know, there's adults there. And I felt like a child on my freshman year and I was 18, 19 years old. So it, I think it would just feel from your perspective, like there was all these, you know, adults around and you're still a kid at that time. Absolutely. So there was a little bit of imposter syndrome. Don't get me wrong. Um, what's funny is that my sophomore year, I became a resident advisor. So I was 16 and I was a resident advisor of a graduate board. You can probably envision my amusement at telling everyone to turn up at 11 p.m. and confiscating people with alcohol when I was five or six years younger than they were. But no one really asked that question back then. Um, perhaps I played it up well, um, but it was amusing. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And then and I guess we can go on after this. But another question is all the people in your program, were they ready, like academically all to go to college? Or did some of them flunk out because it was like too hard? I think people were similar to me in that they graduated earlier than your typical four years. So they were incredibly well prepared. Um, many of them went on to pursue graduate degrees relatively early okay that's interesting yeah I've, I've met a couple of people that have went to college early my brother graduated um high school a year early but like 15 is different than 17 there's like a lot of development in those those years i feel like so that's interesting um 100 and if you're a woman i wouldn't ask you this but how old are you now i'm 34 34 okay so we're about we're all the same age here so that that's cool so the do you think that the experience that you got in college early helped you prepare for, you know, the job that you're doing now or the firm that you're running now? I think the elements that I didn't fully appreciate, um, and this was probably a little bit of my upbringing, they always describe first time founders being product focused, second time founders being distribution focused. I think being Asian American, it's even more exacerbated that we care so much about product. And as you all know, it's not the smartest person who gets and achieves the most. It's oftentimes the individual who was probably best at sales because yeah. ultimately you have to sell your wife on marrying you, your kids on eating vegetables. Like you run the gamut, like every day you're selling in some way, shape, form. And someone who grew up prizing themselves on product, i.e. their capabilities, oftentimes does not, that does not jive well. So I would say it was a rude shock to my system um, whenever I hit corporate America, when I realized that being just good at your job wasn't going to be sufficient. Like you needed to be able to build relationships, rapport, build trust, grow up together. And that will all skill sets that really took a significant amount of time for me to understand and then start to build and refine and grow into. So I would say that probably was not the best upbringing for what I do today. But you deal with the hand that you're dealt, right? Yeah, it seems like, you know, you did it. You, you're dealing you're dealing with it pretty well. So this firm that you have, is it? it's your firm. Do you have partners in this firm? Unfortunately, not today. Not yet. Not yet. Our aspirations are to bring more people on board who would be partners longer term. And, and how long have you had the firm for? Seven years. Seven. Is that when you moved to New York when you started it? That's right. And I guess New York is the place to be for this kind of product sale or this kind of sell. Is, is that the only place or is major cities kind of thing? Um, so I would say New York was more so of a fail fast. And so like I tell entrepreneurs all the time that as much as their opportunity cost is of their uh, the amount of money they're giving up, it's also a, mention, a big function of their time. And so I felt that I wanted to give myself a two-year shot clock through which I would either be successful and the firm would take off and survive or I was going to go back to my old private equity fund. And so I asked myself, where would that be most conducive for me to just grind? And New York was ultimately that answer. We have constantly been on a two-year shot clock, whereby I said, 
we're going to achieve X, Y, and Z in two years. And if not, I'm going to go back to my old firm. We've got, gone through obviously a number of those shot clocks. We've exceeded our expectations and grown significantly, but it's a helpful mentality. I think Bezos always say it's day one or day zero. Um, and so having that urgency that New York brings to bear um, is something that I found to be incredibly valuable in our development. How many employees do you have? That are onshore and offshore, about 13 of us together, all together. So when, you know, just by talking to you, do you have other, are there other businesses that are doing now exactly what you're doing since this is such kind of a new, I mean, 30 years is a blip on, on the radar, right? People have been buying and selling real estate since the beginning of this country. This is a new, fairly new thing. How many, do you have a lot of competition in this space? Are people popping up and figuring this out? So tax is the largest asset class that most have never even heard of. So let me give you two examples of competitors that you guys have probably used, but never thought about. So have you guys gone to Europe and had your wives buy themselves nice bags by chance? Not or in Europe. Maybe? No, not in Europe, but Got yeah. So typically individuals who have unfortunately experienced that, unfortunately my wife has bought some stuff, um, whenever they go to the airport, they're entitled to what is known as a VAT tax refund. And so the VAT tax refund would basically say, hey, Ryan, we're going to pay you $1,000 um, in two months whenever you get home to the U.S. There's a business at the airport called Global Blue. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange today. And all they basically say is, Ryan, instead of waiting for 1000 bucks in two months, we'll give you 900 bucks today. All they do is factor it against a VAT tax refund. H&R Block, whenever they file, you file your taxes on April 15th, the U.S. government says, Ryan, you've been a phenomenal citizen. You've overpaid your taxes. You've over help in your W-2. We're going to pay you $1,000 in two weeks. H&R Block says, I'll give you $900 today. All we're doing in all these transactions is effectively just factoring, delivering dollars today for more dollars over time. I do it for corporates and businesses that are public and investment grade, but there are so many other opportunities within tax to perform the same opportunity set. Interesting. So it's it's just uh, a middleman, basically. Uh, that's all it is. So you're taking a little okay. chunk, paying it off. Okay. So that, it's starting to make a little bit more sense. And when you say like, you buy a bag and you get a tax credit. What in the corporate world, what are those credits? Those are the like, cause you know, I don't have a W2 job, but we just pay the government, right? For our, I own a couple of different companies based around real estate. We just pay them, but we don't expect them to give us money back essentially. Um, what, where's so that? If you did, like you bought a piece of new real estate. You might do a carry back. Might you? Yeah. So yeah. So like a like a future depreciation kind of thing, a, a cost seg study. Is that what you're is that what you're talking Correct. about? And then you might carry back and amend your historical taxes. Okay. And then the IRS might say, Ryan, we owe you a refund as a result of the amended taxes. And we might they might say we owe it to you in a, in a couple of weeks, but you might need cash now. There is this home run deal that Nick has brought you, and he's like, we need the fund today to get this deal done. You're like. I mean, I have a receivable from the U.S. government that's coming in a couple of weeks. God knows the IRS is going to, when are they going to pay me? But like, I just need dollars today. There are solutions yeah. to be had for that. Okay. So is that essentially what you're describing now? That's what your company does? We do that for public businesses. Gotcha. That so are investment a, great and new but it's a little bit of arbitrage on what they're going to get back. You just give it to them in an accelerated way. So essentially you are a giant check cashing facility, right? Like people come into you, they say, Hey, I'm going to get this money in six months. If it's a million dollars now, if you give me 900 K right now, we'll, we'll do the deal. And then you make a hundred K that's essentially what it is, right? That's all it is. Is there a certain percent that you guys like to see? Like, let's say they're going to get a million in six months and they want money today. Typically is there a formula? For 10 to 15 years. So we typically seek to buy it for 40 cents on the dollar. 
So you're going to get a million dollars over the next 10 years, $100,000 a year. We'll give you $400,000 today. Gotcha. And then you'll collect, do you reach out to, I, I guess it's not the government, right? That, that was just an example. So you, where is that other money that you're going to receive if you take it off of their hands? Where is that coming from? It's still coming through the government, right? The government, they have cash tax savings that they're Okay. not paying to the U.S. government. I am then But collecting that. are they able to just sign that over to you then? Or how does that work? Unfortunately not. I wish that was a clean lockbox me So, mechanism. so That's not, unfortunately, how this works today. is there any downside to that then? Can the person who has control over it say after they get that 400,000, is there They any can way go around? bankrupt. Then that's my risk. Which Okay. is why we underwrite primarily public businesses that are investment grade. Okay. And then, so you're taking 60%. What is your like net at the end of the day? I'm assuming that you have like a syndication of capital investors that, that give you money to buy these assets. And then the 60% that you're getting, uh, what does that break down to after you pay, I'm sure your expensive New York city office and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so we tend to think of us originating in the high teens. Okay. So that's pretty good return for, and it's, it's heavily underwritten assets. So you're, you're looking at businesses for their long-term profitability and you know, what, how successful they've been over time. And that's going to tell you That's right. now, I guess, well, can you just give me an example of like, you know, a Shake Shack? And I guess I can kind of think of a couple in my head, but maybe for the listeners, like, Why would a highly successful business need to take 40 cents on the dollar right now when they could just hold it, hold the same note for 10 years um, and get the full amount? W what would be some scenarios that like a very highly underwritten and, and tradable company, why would they do this? So let's start with, I don't think many people even understand tax, um, unfortunately. As we've migrated away from active investing to passive investing, I think I just heard a stat that it's a nine to one ratio today, passive to active. So passive, your 401k pensions, among others, buying ETFs and mutual funds, active being your long short hedge fund. who is actively on an intrinsic value basis valuing things. As things have moved away, ETFs, among others, that are focused on things such as index inclusion, among others, or index composition more specifically, they buy almost indiscriminately. So they're not saying this should be worth 10 times. They're like, this is 10% of the, of the S&P 500. We're buying it. Apple, Microsoft. the mag sub. And so as a result, they are not valuation discriminatory in, that, in a way that they should be. So active investors are very discriminatory. They're like, you trade for 100x, I'll, I prefer to buy the business that is a 10x. Right? Makes sense. Like they are very focused on their returns. ETFs, mutual funds, they're not, they're very insensitive to price. And so let alone an item such as a tax asset. So they look at things from a revenue growth and EBITDA multiple, among others. They don't ever think about free cash flow because free cash flow is very hard to standardize between one, changes in working capital, two, cap capital expenditure intensity, and finally, debt capitalization, which drives interest expense. And the fourth one is cash taxes. Like those four items are incredibly hard to standardize in an algorithmic model. And so as a result, they ignore those four items. And so for us, like to a smart investor, if I said to you, think about two businesses, um, one that are equal for all intents and purposes, they have a hundred million of NOI each and each trades for a 5% cap rate. you would say that's a $2 billion piece of property. But if I said that one of them comes with $2 billion of light tax credit, low income housing tax credit, you would say, hey, the one with the low income housing tax credit is worth more than the one without. All things being equal. Public markets disagree. They're like, we don't care. We don't, 
discriminate to the fact that one has it, one does not. We're paying the same for both. And so okay. smart private equity investors have been extracting this asset for themselves. I'm providing liquidity to those private equity investors in a secondary liquidity format. Okay, so they can take that money, invest it, and turn it into more money faster than essentially waiting. Correct. Because what we, what we buy are long-dated annuity streams. Think about them like a musical royalty, a pharmaceutical royalty. People want to compound and get enterprise value. They don't want cash flow streams. Many don't in the private equity game. Can you explain a little bit about what the beginning stages of your business look like when you first moved to New York and maybe the first six months of like you starting your business? It was an absolute grind. I don't I think there's no way other way to say it. Like when what are some of the I guess like what are some of the things that you had to to do to get it off the ground? So first and foremost was proving to myself that there was a business to be had. So could we get a deal done? As you all know, you guys probably talked to a bunch of individuals who aspire, have aspirations to be fund managers. And oftentimes the easiest way to ultimately end up raising a fund is to get deals done. And so I was under the notion that we should seek to get a deal locked up. We got it, we bought it, we got under exclusivity for a single transaction. And then I went to my old, the partners at my old private equity fund and said, hey, you said you got, would help me back me for a deal. Here's a great deal. Why don't you do it? And they said, wonderful. Here is X million dollars. Um, now go raise the rest of the money from our friends. And I was like, okay, makes sense. And I went to Ryan, Nick, and they're like, you come highly recommended. But as much as I like the deal, I hate the idiosyncratic risk of the deal. I'm like, okay, so what do you mean by that? You're like, we much rather do a fund. And I was like, but that's not what I was raising. I was looking to raise for a deal. And so I went back to my old partners and they were like, are you stupid? They basically just gave you a fund. So let's just do a fund. And so I fell ass backwards into it after call it um, for three months. And, and we got our first deal done um, in the fund format. And then we were able to aggregate five other deals into the transaction before we went um, and got ready to raise off one too. Okay, interesting. And what kind of like, so for a new asset class, I call it new, it's 30 years old, whatever, new asset class like this, what are some of the struggles in selling it to people? Do you have to educate a lot of people in this or in people in that world, do they kind of just know what this is more than, you know, the Joe Schmo real estate guys like we are? No, there's a ginormous educational element requisite for it. Like our fund one, um, after we had raised a bunch of it to close that single deal, I went out and did 800 meetings to get 16 other tickets. So yeah. that's a 2% yield. So I was just kissing frogs like none of them. Nice. And so it's a lot easier to raise after you have a couple of deals under your belt. Um, and it just takes time. And so I always tell aspiring fund managers, just get a deal done. It makes everything so much more tangible and understandable to people that you can point to. So in our space, like you mentioned before, one of the benefits to what we do is that it's highly leverageable, right? We can put down 20% on an asset and the bank will give us the rest. Is that something that happens in your space? Can you raise money from institutions like banks or do you have to go private investor, private money kind of thing? So we had a facility that we raised in 2021 um, from a large bond bracket. Um, we paid it off early this year um, and we are approaching the public markets, um, the asset-based security markets for it. So think about it as your version of a CMBS loan. Um, we're approaching those markets today. Okay. Because we were able to achieve an investment grade rating on our portfolios. Okay, so now those institutional, we call it institutional money, whatever you want to call it, that now they're starting to get interested because you have a proven track record in, in this And space. a portfolio. And a portfolio. So are they back. They always want to, they much, instead of 
as good as your track record is, they always much rather underwrite the asset. Right. Can they get comfortable around the asset? If they can get comfortable around the asset, they'll then figure out if you have a durable track record for them to back you. Okay. So it's almost similar to raising syndication money for real estate deals in, in a sense, where you could go private money, you prove that you can do it, and then the banks start giving you money. That's essentially kind of the, the short story on how both of us got started. Absolutely. So, Look, it's life is life is all the same. It's crawl, walk, run. yeah. So like, what's the minimum amount that somebody that you seek at a time from an individual or from a, a company that you're looking to raise money? Um, we are invested up primarily endowments and foundations. Um, we rarely take individuals. It's about um, on the low end, about five million dollars. Okay, so you're looking for big, big companies that I want to invest with you, not necessarily like an accredited investor that might have a hundred thousand dollars to throw into a fund to hopefully get a ten percent, you know, yield. Yeah, um, we are a QP oriented vehicle and a qualified purchaser. And so in that regard, um, we just have higher minimums. And it's also one of those items where just given that our product, you guys are incredibly sophisticated. Um, it's a difficult educational sale. And so we primarily focus on the institutional channel because of the larger checks associated and the fact that they may have some more familiarity with the assets. And it's probably just as much work too, right? And in our space, you know, you hear a lot of people saying it's the same amount of work to buy one single family house as it may be to buy like a multi, a bigger multifamily. You still got to do the same underwriting. It's just bigger numbers, essentially. Absolutely. So when... And there's also a level that uh, my old firm, like they have raised north of a hundred plus billion dollars. And so as it pertains to brand recognition, um, they have brand recognition among sovereign wealth funds, like large pensions, large endowments and foundations. Like they did not have, their minimum check was $75 million. So like a typical high net worth wouldn't have been a target for them. And so they had never built brand recognition associated with that clientele. And so like when I left, there was a little bit of incongruence as to the people who would fund us initially and the LPs that they had. which made it very challenging. And when, so how that, how does that work with when they give you the money, let's just say it's a minimum of $5 million. How does your structure for them go? Do, do they get paid like a monthly? Like for us, we raise private money. I buy a building. I refinance the building after I stabilize it and renovate it. I get my investors money back. But in the meanwhile, we pay them a monthly, you know, dividend, whether it's a 10% or 12%, whatever uh, annual return, we're paying them you know, most of the time per month, or we hit them off at the end at the refi. How does that work for the investors that are investing in, in your fund? Do they get a monthly dividend check? Uh, you know, it's a big, uh, these are big numbers that we're talking, or is it like there's an end game where they're going to get 85 million or a hundred million back? Or how does that work? Yeah, so we pay them out once a year, typically in December. Um, so think about it as one's an one annual check. And that's just a percentage of whatever, you know, they put 75 in, they get X percent, and then here you go, here's your profit. That's right. What's And the go ahead. what's the most common? Is it the same percent that you give, or is it kind of negotiated back and forth uh, most of the time? With our invest our LPs or with the companies that we buy them from. Um, With with your LPs. yeah, the LPs. uh with our LPs, um, we have the traditional fund structure. Um, so that is you return the with principal, then the prof, then you get carried. And it's an 80 20 split split typically. Um, so like the cash flows are whatever the cash flows are on an annual basis. Um, and we send all the money back that we receive. So that can change yearly, depending on the maturity of the portfolio. Okay. And then your LPs that you are trying to get involved, if they were, you know, underwriting you, they would look at, okay, what asset are we buying? How many years till maturity? That That's kind of underwriting that they would have to do, right? Because if they bought into something now that had a 15 year maturity on it, they, they have to kind of be in that thing for the long haul with you, right? That's right. Okay. And so that, um, when you're going out and you're selling this, like, 
you're you said big are you looking at like pension funds and and that kind of like managers of equity firms that have access to this kind of capital That's right. nice that's that's uh you said we were sophisticated but this sounds a whole lot more sophisticated than what we do so it's it's interesting and Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's it's almost nothing in life that's rocket science with the exception of rocket science. So everything is addition, subtraction, multiplication, sometimes division, which is really just multiplication by a fraction. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. So now what are some of your goals moving forward with this fund? I know you're you're not a huge fan of New York City. What what kind of are, you know, your your goals to get out of that rat race? Do you have ideas to sell this company to a private equity firm eventually or sell off pieces to We're on the path to go in public. Um, Okay. our goal is we have a North Star called Royalty Pharma. Um, they are a pharmaceutical royalty business that has aggregated and rolled up a number of drug royalties. So think of your typical Humira's of the world, um, where we may pay ten dollars for a drug and they might get a dollar royalty for it. Like they've gone public, they treat. like a rock star on a dividend yield basis, our goal and our job is to do the exact same thing. That um that whole process of going public. Now, we both own and operate small businesses here. I have about 60 employees over the couple of businesses that we own, but none of never did I think of like trying to go public with it. It's not probably a viable thing. What makes some companies like yours viable to go public? Is there a number? Is there like what what made you think, okay, now it's time that I start to think about going public? What would be the benefit for you and and kind of what is that? What does that look like? I think it's a number of items. I think the first and foremost is competitive advantage. Um, the cost of private dollars tends to be more expensive than public dollars. And so in that regard, I want to have an advantage cost of capital by having a public equity that I can do transactions with. One, two, it then gives me a public currency for me to do in-kind transactions. So someone has a tax asset, I'm willing to give them stock in my business in return for their tax asset. Um, and so there are a number of items you need to be institutional. And so it forces a discipline upon the organization that is incredibly beneficial and it drives down our cost of debt significantly. So there are a number of those items that I might describe that enable us to pursue um, a competitive advantage that a public listing may procure. Does it also add, like the way you just described it, I'll, I'll dumb it down a little bit, is like a bunch of red tape, essentially, to what you have to do? Do you have to, you know, hire more people in your company to kind of manage the uh, regulations and that kind of thing? Absolutely. But I would consider it almost a discipline. Like, can you, do you really have as durable of a business as you make it out to be? And so, like, I fundamentally believe, believe that I'm building a durable business. And in that regard, like, the red tape, red tape that is put and enforced upon us is just something that I view as the next avenue through which um, we should be able to meet that standard. That's a good way to look at it. Is there a certain uh, valuation before the a company can go public? I mean, well, you could go public in Canada for a relatively low value. Um, it's more so a function of But you, uh, the goal, like I mentioned, is a public currency that's valuable. If you are a micro cap with no liquidity, that's not valuable. No one wants it. Like a They're penny like, this stock. is, this is worse um, than a private business. And so, like, my sense is that you want to be in the three to five billion dollars of good before you even contemplate taking the first step. Anything below that probably is premature. That's interesting. Okay. And Like do you you wouldn't list a uh, real estate portfolio with $5 million of red tape costs um, when it's only $100 million, right? It would destroy all the NOI. 
Yeah. So do you invest in anything else besides into your company, into these TRAs? I'm not smart enough in that regard. Life is about edge, right? Like I don't pretend that I have edge in real estate. I don't pretend I have edge in fixed income or anything like that. I have edge in one domain and one domain only. So all your eggs are in the TRA. They're, they're all in the TRA basket. Correct. Nice. So um, what are some of your like day-to-day -day tasks with your company now? You're, you know, you're an owner operator. Um, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Are you selling this? Are you trying out there educating? Are you just managing employees in your office? Like what does your day-to-day -day look like? So on a weekly basis, I do something on the order of magnitude 30 plus meetings externally. With their number of internal meetings as well, as well as service provider meetings that or stakeholder meetings that I need to be part of. Um, but those do not count towards what I might describe as the external facing discussions. And so think about those as one to one sales discussions, um, like discussion that we're having right now is potentially a one to many discussion. And so finding avenues to engage with as many people as possible that we are targeting is a big element of what we do. Okay. Interesting. So you're out there, you're taking meetings, educating people, s selling people, still managing your people. Frauds. Yeah. Still doing the same, the same thing. So that, it's that's like not, none of it's rocket. Like it's the, the volume of meetings that we do results in the more people being educated about what we do to the extent there's a cohort of those individuals who will want to take the next step and understand, have a deeper understanding of what we do. Eventually we move down the funnel to, they might want to buy what we do uh, from an investor perspective. And on the flip side, we educate sellers on the value of their assets. Some may not want to take the next step, others may, and then we just keep moving them down the funnel. And so like the top of the funnel is the most important part of the game. And so constantly filling that and ensuring that we are top of mind, building awareness, growing um, the base through which we're ultimately channeling through our sales funnels is an incredible so, element of the business. In addition to the sales, uh, the face-to-face -face sales meetings that you do have, do you also, how do you, how do you market the business as well? So having marketing, I would say is obvious is, one of those elements that has, was incredibly challenging historically. And so when I think of marketing and the one-to-many discussions, it's been a function of can we deliver value to people that they would find A, to be valuable, and B, would make their lives better. And so what information can we share that people might find to be interesting? And so the, with the rise of asset-based finance, people have been looking for uncorrelated products. And so we have published a bunch of thought leadership on the space. We can literally put people to sleep with thought leadership. Like we have 150 plus pages of single space documents for people to go to care and insomnia with. And so that's one avenue where you can create leverage. You write once, people can read it thousands of times among others. Um, conversations like this, where think, um, we get the benefit of your platform and we get to educate a bunch of individuals that we might not be able to touch on a one-to-one -one basis. That reduces um, our customer acquisition cost, among others. And so as I think about marketing, it's a part of the process that we constantly need to be building and growing into. That's interesting. I, I was kind of wondering, I was like, okay, so you're talking to a couple of, uh, you know, small business guys, we got some real estate in your world is what we do is a couple of bucks, right? So what value do the individuals bring? Is it when you go public, they might put money into that stock? Is that what you're kind of targeting? Because right now, Nick and I don't have $75 million to put into your fund. And yeah. I don't think a lot of our listeners, do, you know, with, um, you know, maybe the exception of somebody that knows somebody that owns this big company or something, but like for the, for the regular person, if you're targeting pension funds and stuff like that, are you targeting people that might work for those funds or people that are going to invest in the future into your stock? Absolutely. So I think it's about brand awareness, right? Like 
you want to have to be in the ears of people such that whenever they do encounter you, when you do engage with them, then you're like, I heard you on a podcast that I'm, I love Ryan's podcast. I heard it. Um, and I heard you on it. But yeah, I'd love to take that meeting. Like it makes that first conversation so much more, so much warmer as they feel like they know you. Hmm. That's a, yeah. That's a good point. That's probably but it's one of the reasons we like to do the podcast is we get to talk to people. We typically focused on a lot of the hyper local people that are in our industry, what we would call like, you know, higher level investors that have, you know, hundreds to thousands of properties that or units, you know, depending. And um, we get to talk to them and learn from them and learn from people like you. So it's, it's sort of the same, uh, same thing. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, so what is, we, I, I'll put it in the description on the YouTube channel and stuff, but what is the name of your business and how could people find any information about it? Yeah, um, it's Parallaxis Capital. Um, we're active on LinkedIn and we love engaging with people on that platform. Um, and I've been a big fan of you guys and what you guys have been doing, educating people. Um, I enjoyed the episode that you guys had with the Bigger Pockets guys. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one for us. That was a, a full circle moment. We started our real estate journey listening to him and then, you know, got to go to his house and, you know, talk and do all that stuff. So that, that was cool. Um, we, we definitely appreciate your time and we want to make sure that our listeners get, are able to get in touch with you. So guys, check out the link in the description. We have all the links from your, um, assistant or whoever contacted us to get you on here. So I'll put all that stuff in there and, Hopefully somebody learned something about TRAs today because I definitely, I, did. I, did I definitely sure. learned a lot and I was, my head was spinning a little bit. Um, but it, in the end, it's kind of a simple arbitrage game. And, and like you said, it's not rocket science. And now I kind of have a good grasp, I think, on what, what you're doing. So that's pretty cool. And congratulations on all the success uh, with building this company and learning about something that I would say you're in the very small minority of people that know about it. The tallest midget is how I describe it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say that if I, you know, go around, we have an event that we're hosting this week. I'm going to ask a couple people, do you know what a TRA is? I bet you most of them are going to say no. So it's cool that now you sound incredibly smart. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to use. I'm going to now go talk to my wife and, and make her seem silly. <laughs> But no, Andy, we we definitely appreciate your time and this will come out in a couple of weeks. We'll get in touch with you and we, we uh, you know, hopefully one day our, our business lives will cross. Be well, sir. Take care. All right, All right Andy. Thank you.